Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Candyman Farewell to the Flesh, the first sequel to Candyman, released in 1995. Although it never comes close to the quality of the first film, because how could it, Farewell to the Flesh at least tries to be a good movie. Unfortunately, with its slow plotting, forgettable characters, and repetitious beats, it never surpasses mediocrity. The only time it achieves anything close to greatness is during during a flashback near the end. But hey, that's more than can be said for the third film, which is an abject piece of shit. Just you wait. Farewell to the Flesh sees Tony Todd return as Candyman, who this time through is given a real name, Daniel Robitaille. But since Bernard Rose's idea of a sequel wasn't what the studio wanted, they replaced him as a director with Bill Condon, who would go on to direct Dreamgirls and both parts of Twilight Breaking Dawn, and write Greatest Showman and Gods and Monsters, the latter earning him a writing Oscar. Despite Condon's able hand at the helm, Candyman 2 never does anything remarkable. It just fills in some more backstory and gives us more people getting killed with a hook through their backs. But sometimes, all you need is a sequel to exist in order to cement a horror killer as iconic. And Farewell to the Flesh certainly does exist. How many kills will Candyman hook for himself the second time around? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins with another open mouth mural of Candyman, who's immediately given a name during a recap of his backstory. Daniel Robitaille was the son of slaves. This slideshow of exposition is being presented by Professor Philip Purcell, that guy from the first movie who's faithful to only one nation under God. Candyman country. Hail to the hook, baby. His speech during a book tour tells us everything we already know about Candyman. Hand cut off, stung to death, ghost in the mirror, you know. You know. Purcell says that the people who died in the first film were killed by Helen Lyle acting out the urban legend. And to prove that Candyman isn't real, he says his name five times in a reflective book sleeve. Candyman. And see, nothing happened. Except this hook through the screen. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. That's just a ruse to sell books. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to meet our Candyman Peter. Good job, Peter. But you've got to look more confident up there, dude. You have to be Candyman. On Purcell's way home, he stopped by a guy named Ethan Tarrant, who blames Purcell for his father's death. His father having been killed by the Dulce dude. You told him there was no Candyman. You told him to say the name and now he's dead. Damn, Tim Taylor's dad got killed by Candyman? Bummer. Purcell dismisses Ethan and ducks into a bar, and in the bathroom, he faces the consequences of his book cover recital when Candyman appears. With a hook in the back, Purcell joins Candyman's Vic list, getting blood all over his hardcover before Candyman drops him like it's hot and disappears. The opening credits introduce us to this movie setting, New Orleans, Louisiana, three days before Lent. But that's not gonna stop anyone from getting a head start on their Shroven. A disembodied radio DJ tells us how this movie got its subtitle. He says it's what Carnival means in Latin. Farewell to the flesh. Actually, some light research shows that that's a folk etymology using the meaning of carne vale. But I'm not here to piss on anyone's parade, so go right on ahead and keep celebrating, y'all. Our new leading lady is Annie Tarrant, who bears a certain superficial similarity to Helen Lyle. She's a teacher for kids like Matthew here whose favorite hobby is drawing pictures of Candyman. And although the kids can be a bit of a handful sometimes, it's not quite as hectic as her family life. See, her brother is that Ethan dude, and he's currently being held for the murder of Professor Purcell. Hey, what gives you cops the right to arrest this guy? I did it. I confessed. End of story. Oh, he, he confessed. Yeah, that'll usually do it, I guess. This detective dude, Ray, is especially pleased to have Ethan in custody and plans to charge him with some other unsolved murders as well. Namely, three John Doe's and Ethan's very own father, Coleman Tarrant, since all four of those victims died in a hooktastic way like Purcell. Annie doesn't believe that her brother is guilty and thinks he's just punishing himself for not being able to save their father. He tells her to drop it, but doesn't share any of his Candyman suspicions, lest little sis get the idea to make a candy call in the mirror. And to be extra careful, he even disconnects the nearest phone line. <laughs> I love the way Ray freaks out back there when the mirror breaks. This whole Ethan is a murderer thing is pretty hard on Annie and their mom Octavia, who's already having a rough go of it, seeing as how she's got cancer and all. Octavia is played by Veronica Cartwright in her third episode of The Kill Count, after her appearance as a child in The Birds and as a young woman in Alien. 
Now we've got her middle age, so we just need her when she's older and we'll have the whole Cartwright set. Annie goes back to her weird looking apartment with some fake looking red lighting outside and continues to work on her portrait of, wait, Hillary Clinton? Or maybe she just purchased that piece of art. It kinda looks like a George W. Bush original. She wants to find out more about how her father died, so she takes her boring husband Paul to her childhood home where it happened. A big ol' abandoned plantation looking building. Although she and Ethan grew up here, it's not now totally empty, save for some graffiti and this bird. Oh, and a messed out Alfie Allen looking guy. But he and his bros don't stop Annie from looking around, so she takes Paul to her childhood room, which has a giant wall mirror and a clear view of the old slave's quarters. She then continues on to her dad's room, where he died, and there she finds all sorts of the usual Candyman artwork, up to and including an entire damn altar to the guy. <laughs> Looks like Pop Pop had a bit of a sweet tooth, huh Annie? She returns to work, where she finds finds Matthew and another kid fighting over his pictures of Candyman. She tells the kids that Candyman's not real, and to prove that she doesn't believe in him, she foolishly looks into a mirror and says his name five times. Candyman. Oh hey, nothing happened. Except, wait a minute, is that a bee buzzing by the window? Aw oh, shit, Ms. Annie, you probably pretty fucked right now. I can't believe you actually did that. What, the Candyman thing? Or putting fish bones down the garbage disposal? Just get ready to call a plumber real soon, y'all. But no, Paul the CMT spokesperson there is in disbelief over Annie's Candyman call. Even though she reassures herself, she didn't do anything risky. There are no monsters. Oh yeah, Annie? Then who's that? You know who it is, it's the one and only Candyman! With that sweet sing-song voice. <laughs> Tony Todd delivers more lines, with his voice sounding like warm honey, or er, sorry, that was an insensitive simile, I'm sure, then spins Annie around like a little ballerina. A candy ballerina! But he's not gonna be able to abduct another blonde lady into the ether if she's got a lousy, stinking husband running around. So Candyman takes care of that and kills Paul right in front of Annie by sticking a hook through his back. Candyman even lifts Paul off the ground to show Annie just how good a mythical killer he is. You don't need to stare the whole time though, dude. It's starting to get unnerving. Just drop it, okay? Thank you. With bees all over his face now, Candyman scares Annie away. Although try as she might, she just can't escape the guy. You're mine. Is she though? Cause next thing you know, she's talking to the police again, then hanging out at her mom's house. I don't really get the plotting of this movie sometimes. Annie awakens the next day on Mardi Gras and finds some breakfast tea waiting for her. Want any honey with that tea? Come with me and sing the song of misery. Or uh, misery with that tea? Miser tea? But this Candyman appearance, and his murder of Annie's mom, turns out to be but a dream, since Annie awakens again and finds Octavia doing just fine. Well, you know, besides the cancer. Annie gets a visit from a couple of the kids she teaches, who tell her that Matthew went missing last night. Oh no, what if Candyman took him? Oh no, and what if Octavia knows more than she's letting on about Candyman? Sure seems like she does. Annie goes to Matthew's house and speaks with his father, Reverend Ellis. So that's what became of Radio Raheem. Guess he chose the path of love over hate. He shows her Matthew's extensive portfolio of Candyman drawings, and then she leaves, a bit unsettled by being included in his work. She returns to the police station and tells her brother that she's learned about Candyman and even said his name five times in a mirror. Oh, yeah, dude, maybe you should have warned her about B-Boy instead of keeping it a secret between you and your dead dad. Turns out their daddy man was obsessed with the Candyman, and Ethan was left trying to stop him from calling the killer out of the mirror. It worked until it didn't, and Ethan came home to find his dad dead in his room, lying in a pool of blood in front of that candlelit Candyman altar. Ethan says that their dad had found a way to destroy Candyman, and then gives Annie the name of a local dude who may have taught him the secret. Unknowingly followed by that Detective Ray dude, Annie seeks this knowledgeable feller out. His name is Honoré Thibodeau, and it sounds like he's exactly who she's looking for. Sweets? All the sweets. Annie name drops her dead dad, which earns her an invitation into Thibodeau's home, and his super secret lair. He tells her that before he died, Annie's father was looking for the mirror that belonged to Caroline Sullivan, the woman who Candyman loved and died for. Her dad was looking for that mirror because apparently, when Daniel Robitaille died, that's where his soul was caught. So now it's kinda like a Candyman horcrux. A candy crux. Break the mirror. 
break the curse. But since Annie's dad wasn't able to successfully break that mirror, Candyman is still here. And the only thing that guy loves more than flashing people his chest of bees is killing them. So after covering Thibodeau and bees and telling Annie that she's pregnant with their daughter now, wait, what? He kills the honorable honoré by tossing his bee-covered body headfirst through a nearby wall. Annie runs home, avoiding Candyman amidst the Mardi Gras parades, and hops into the shower so she can wash all the bees off and run a hand over her newly pregnant belly. Having gotten an earful about Candyman's backstory, she begins to wonder about her own connection to the dude. Who am I? So she tracks down Reverend Ellis again, and he takes her to a library to learn her something spicy. He was born at the Esplanade Plantation. That's my family's house. She returns to her old family home and finds Candyman's resting place, and alongside it, the resting place of his love, Caroline Sullivan, who turns out was also the mother of his child. We had a daughter. Back at the police station, Detective Ray yells at Ethan some more and decides to tease his perp by calling for Candyman with some very entertaining enthusiasm. Candyman. No. Candyman. No, don't. Candyman. No. Candyman. Don't. Candyman. That's a great way to get yourself killed, dude. Candyman puts an end to Ray's stupid smile by hooking him in the back and tossing him through a giant window in the police station. Aw, that lady's day just got totally ruined. When another cop goes to see what happened, Ethan stupidly makes a run for it, earning himself a bullet through the back and a death tumble down some very long stairs. Why would you run in that situation, dude? You're in a police station filled with armed cops. What'd you think was gonna happen? Even though you didn't actually do anything, as this video footage shows, I'm really glad they included this. I've always wanted to see what it looked like objectively when Candyman was murdering people. Annie sneaks into Octavia's home and goes into her mother's secret vanity drawer, where she finds pictures of Candyman's lover and eight-year-old daughter. She confronts Octavia and yells at her for lying to them about their history, because turns out Candyman's daughter Isabel was Octavia's grandmother, which makes Annie Candyman's great-great-grandmother. Daughter. Yo, but what was all that stuff about their baby being in her womb then? Octavia's always known about this, but when Annie's father Coleman started looking into their candy family tree, Octavia blocked him out and set forth on a devoted path of denial. There is no candy man! Come on now, lady, you know what happens when people say that shit. They get the hook! Candyman stabs his great-granddaughter in the back, although all we see of it is some blood seeping out the front. He drops her to the ground and starts telling Annie that through her, he can continue his legend along their lineage, all while Octavia crawls over to her security system and presses an alarm. Octavia then dies with a quiet apology, which leaves her daughter Annie screaming and her great-grandpa Daniel piecing the fuck out of there. Annie runs through parades in some big ol' fat rain back to her childhood home, where she finds Matthew hiding out. Oh yeah, that kid was kind of a character, wasn't he? Together, they break into the old slave's quarters, which sits right at the mouth of the Mrs. Mississippi, but after she falls through some busted ass boards, she sends him away to get help. Thus, she's all by her lonesome when she finally finds Caroline Sullivan's mirror, resting right below a bunch of spoopy skeletons in the rafters. She reaches for it, but Candyman appears and tells her, no, don't go messing with his soul home, because after all, he wasn't always a bad guy. In fact, here, check this flashback out. Although, is a flashback really necessary? We've already heard how he died a whole bunch of times. You must see what they did. Oh, okay, we've got to see it. Be my witness. If you say so, dude. Actually, like I said up top, this flashback is probably the best part of the movie. No surprise, since it's centered around Tony Todd giving a heart-wrenching performance as Daniel Robitaille is murdered for the crime of falling in love. Sure, the clothes here may look more like costumes in a community center play than period-accurate attire, but dude, they're sawing his freaking hand off. That more than makes up for any low-budget costuming. True to the tale, the racist bastards who beat him down then cover him with honey from a couple of broken honeycombs. Which is, of course, how he got his name. Candyman. <laughs> Candyman. And his catchphrase. Sweets to the sweet! When a biblical swarm of bees approaches them, the lynch mob backs away and allows Daniel Robitaille to get swarmed and stung by all of them. He survives long enough for his love Caroline to find him, and it's a truly sad scene that even Candyman can't help but cry over. Before Daniel Roba dies, he cries out in pain and curses his killers. You will all be damned. 
With one last utterance of his name into Caroline's mirror, he gives up the ghost. Although, as we all already know, his soul will live on in legend. Annie is sympathetic to her ancestor's story because, hey, who wouldn't be? But she thinks of all the innocents he murdered in his pursuit of her, and that gives her the resolve to snatch Caroline's mirror off the wall. Aw, oh, Annie, that was a load-bearing mirror. You can't just go removing that without causing some serious structural damage. The building floods and sweeps both of them away, but after floating along with the shrubbery and skeletons, Annie gets saved by Matthew and the help he brought, which is a bunch of other kids. Hey, uh, Matthew, couldn't get the fire department or something? They successfully escape the torrent of water, and on their way out, Annie grabs Caroline's mirror. Candyman tries to stop her one last time by literally standing atop the water, but she smashes the mirror against the wall, killing Candyman's spirit again by somehow turning him into, uh, glass, I guess, since he breaks into a bunch of pieces and then shatters all the hell. Guess he was more like the candy glass man. Annie and Matthew get out of there as the house kind of Wizard of Oz is behind them, then go to Reverend Ellis to get their Ash Wednesday blessings together. The movie ends some years later, with Annie showing her young daughter an old family photo album. But the little girl, Caroline, named after her great-great-grandmother, doesn't want to go to bed right away. She's got other plans instead. To sleep. Yeah, little girl, we just fixed this problem. God damn. How many bodies did Candyman leave lying around the bayou? Let's find out and get to the numbers. But first, I'm James A. Janice, and you're watching Dead Meat. I don't know why I made a mouse for Dead Meat, but uh, I guess just force of habit, you know? There were nine kills in Candyman Farewell to the Flesh, consisting of eight male victims and only one female victim, giving us this very uneven Daniel Roba pie chart. With a runtime of 95 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 10.56 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Paul, cause that dude got raised up off his feet and held real high as Candyman cut him from groin to gullet, just like he's always talking about. Dal Machete for lamest kill goes to Ethan, who ran like an idiot and got a bullet in his back for doing so. The staircase stunt was pretty good though. And that's it. Candyman Farewell to the Flesh came out in 1995, one of the last big horror sequels to hit the market before Scream totally upended it. We'll see how this franchise reacted to the new horror landscape next week. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Stephanie Aguanaga, Charles Messing, Lillen B, Weed Addicted Fish, Alan Cram, Brandon Warren, and Javante Desmond. It's still October, which means you can still pre-order the Dead Meat Collector's Edition of In Search of Darkness, the 80s horror documentary. Check that out in the link in the description. Thanks everyone, be good people.